What's going on, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of So How'd You Get Here? I'm Angelo. I'm Tony. And um, if you're tuning in for the first time, this is a podcast where we dive into... Well, people's backstories. Um, everyone starts somewhere, and we want to know where that place was, um, how long it took to get where they wanted to go, and um, did it look like what they thought when they got there. Or, so, if, they, or if they got there. Or if they got there at all. Um, so today, our, um, we're going to introduce our guest. He's an entrepreneur, music savant. Basically, if there's ever been a concert in this world, he's probably had something to do with it. He's a, a global promoter for Live Nation. I would like to welcome to the show today, Mr. Steve Herman. Thanks. How you doing, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank very you. Nice, Thank nice. you for coming on. Very Thanks cool. for being on our show very, today. Very cool studio setup you have. Wow. Well, um, we just met, so I'm going to just disclaim that I looked through uh, your bio, which is <laughs> impressive, and the very first thing that starts out was 13 years old, bar mitzvah, figured out you wanted to be a promoter. Could you give us a little, little insight into that story? Yeah. I, mean, I guess when I was a kid, um, I lived in a small town in northern Ontario, Canada, you know, we just had one radio station and stuff, and I, I was just obsessed with music from the time I was very small. I learned to play guitar. And by the time I was 13, I had a little band together, and, you know, I wanted my band to be bigger, so I just had had my bar mitzvah, and my family, they give money, you know, for your bar mitzvah right, right. as gifts. Uh, probably shouldn't have taken it. My parents didn't know I was taking it out. But, <laughs> but I took the money out, and I hired this other band to do a concert inside our school, at where I went to junior high school, and I got the, them to let me use the gym, and then I um, hired this band. They're called uh, Axel, and they later became a band called Offenbach. They actually were a fairly f- big Canadian French band. Um, but I sold the tickets so my band could open. I put my was a promoter so my band could open, so I could, sold out the tickets, and I thought, wow, I think I'm a better promoter. I think I, I quit the band. I'm not very good at guitar. They can get a new guitar player, so that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. And so you, you became a, good, a promoter at 13? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really meaning to. I mean, it was, right. it was a, like this would have been like 1974. And it was sort of where the business was come from the 60s to the 70s. And it started becoming a business and there was little promoters in every city. Yeah. Right. Like, uh, you know, there was, it wasn't really an organized business. It was just something one decided to promote. So in, I was in a small town, unfortunately. I wish it was in a bigger one. Because if I had been a bigger one, I could have been a bigger promoter. When you say small town, like how many people were talking? Like, 20, there was 50,000 people, 50, of which half were from America because it was a base where, where NORAD, it was a second NORAD base, like Colorado Springs. Wow. Okay. And it was so a very transient place, but cool. It was a really good place to be. And my family had, uh, you know, mostly been from there, but my, I had an uncle that lived in Toronto. And I would go to summer camp, and after summer camp, I'd go down to Toronto, and that was my favorite thing, because you could listen to Chum, it was a big station. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so what kind of music were you into at that age? I mean, um, I listened to so many things, I guess. I mean, I, there was a, I worked at my dad's store. It was, a, it was a grocery store, and I was a butcher inside the store. It was from 13 to 16, call it sort of thing. And there, okay. was, and there was a little record store. Um, it was called Records on Wheels, and there was a guy named Barry that ran the store, and Fridays the trucks would come in, and... Uh, him and I was, I, he was just, really, he knew I liked music, and he played it in his band, another band, his own band. He was quite a bit older than me. Um, but he let me come over, and the trucks came out. We'd unpack all the trucks, and the albums would be there, and I'd get to look at them, and I, he'd give me a deal on them. So I started listening to records and bringing them home. I mean, I was smoking a lot of weed. And, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it wasn't the kind of weed you have now. You had to smoke 20 of them to get stoned, but right. Mexican, or I think it was called, or something. They, uh, yeah. They've been working on it like it's a cure for cancer. Was it more like hard rock, like rock and roll? Like what? I mean, I think, like, the first... Uh, no, I mean... Was I, like the Doors and Zeppelin? Like, no, the, fir- you- the first thing that happened probably was around... I think around then, like 11 to... Thir- probably 11, 12, yeah. maybe 10. Yeah. We went down... There was Because there was no concerts in North Bay, really, we'd go to... Toronto with the family and we'd go down and we'd go to this thing called the Canadian National Exhibition. It's in downtown Toronto and it was be, you know, probably most cities would have that. That's where the concerts first, it was like your big fair and that's where, the, right. that's where concerts really started to be bigger. So I went there and I saw the Jackson 5 and I oh, saw okay. the Stylistics, yep. the Osmonds with the whole family with Jimmy and everything. Um, you know, that was, just, and I think the next year was when I, my cousin took me and I think I saw it at Emerson, Lake, and Palmer with an orchestra and all this stuff. It was kind of like different moments in time. And then, then my, because of my dad at this grocery store, I used to go. There was a guy that delivered the fruit, and, and he came once a week, and he had a truck. So I could go back to, in the back of the truck to Toronto. And he would go, say, on, on a Monday, or, and then he'd come back on Wednesday. It was always a day I'd stay at my, a couple of days. 
and I'd go see like a show in Toronto and I'd try to get tickets and I you know I remember going to see Kiss like on uh and I had a ticket. It was just myself. I was just in the. I was in the back behind. I was at the top of the thing behind a, like a post. You know, it was super fan. Yeah. Yeah. I used to go. To, so I used to do that all the time and go to concerts. I was a huge concert fan. And then, you know, I was still promoting in my hometown whenever I could. So that's what I would do. And then, but when I was a lot of bar mitzvah yeah. work in, well, in yeah. that area. Well, at that point, at that point, no, no, I wasn't working at bar mitzvah. I was promoting <laughs> shows. So the big show, the first show, I, big show I promoted. I was like sixteen. At the time, there was no national promoters. There was no national agents. I, and I remember I was like, this guy called me, said, we can get this band Russia to play. And I, they were, had this big song. When you're doing a tour, you always need to, like, it's routing. People, like, you can't have it. Everyone can't have a Friday, Saturday. It just right. doesn't work. I mean, the yeah. artist has to have so many shows a week. People say, why is it on a Monday? You know, but, but well, because you live in North Bay. <laughs> so so I, had, I rented the, 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 the arena. We sold the tickets at $10, you know, 4,000 tickets, 40,000. You know, we had expenses and paid them five. And I made more, I think I made 25000 or something, something like mm-hmm. that. It was all At ca- 16 years old. Yeah, it was all cash. Because I just had my friends work the door. I think it's, I, so they, they worked the door. I, um, but the Getty, com- so the artist always comes to get paid. So, he, he, so uh, After the show was over. Well, some of them like to get paid first because they don't trust you. But he, oh. d- he seemed to trust. So it was after the show and he comes in. I'm in this little office. This is basically the referee's room at the arena. And he comes in and he's like, uh, I just wanted to find the promoter. Is your dad? Is it your dad? Or it must be your dad. Is he around? <laughs> I said, it's me. I'm the promoter. <laughs> and he's like, really? So then I paid him. So he, so I mean, he, he, he was pretty impressed. And he told his manager, who's now one of my best friends, to this day, about about that story. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, at that yeah. moment, at 16 years old, did you think? Okay, I kind of made it. Yeah, well, I took the money and I went home, threw it on the bed, and slept in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Just a bed full of uh, <laughs> what were your by, by the way, I sure blew it. Yeah. <laughs> what were your parents thinking at that time? Were they, they like, hey, our, well, our our son really has something going on here? Or are they like they 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 didn't really know. I mean, they, my, my dad he my dad really didn't he didn't really quite get this business and why I was interested in it. And I wouldn't probably either. And I was, you know, and because I'd become so independent anyways, I'd always had jobs. And they didn't really say a lot. I mean, it was basically yeah. they it, I don't think he was happy, but he didn't say anything. Okay, so I'm looking through, um, I'm looking through some of your bio points. I, I see something here that's extremely interesting. Kicked out of high school, three strike rule. You made it through with two strikes and a warning. I would love well, to know about that. Well, um, this how is about because us? you were selling so many tickets. The principal was mad that you were making no, more money than you didn't need high school. Maybe something else I was selling, but um, <laughs> listen, <laughs> no. <laughs> Continue. Um, no, so no, I was definitely. Um, I guess I was just not interested. I mean, I wasn't not interested, but I, my absentee mark was higher was higher than my grade point average kind of thing. Right. Um, and it, and I wasn't. I, I don't know why, but I ended up the first. I kicked out of the first school, mostly because I didn't go. And uh, the second school was where the three strikes happened. That was because I had to beg to get into the school, and so. The only reason I got in, it was a, it, my, my city was, um, besides the half that were the U.S. people that were sort of temporary coming in from the Army and stuff, there were the, about half of the people would have been uh, French. It was French-English. It's northern Canada, and a lot of the people that would grow up in smaller towns in Moosonee, which is near up on the James Bay, more Ar- not Arctic, but closer, they didn't have school, so they'd be shipped down to go to school here, and here it was called Chippewa. But um, when I got kicked out of the sc- first school, there's only three schools in my city. Like, that's it. And um, I didn't really want to not... I guess I wanted to go to school, but uh, I didn't want to go to school kind of thing. And my Was the going to school thing more because you wanted to just appease your parents? It just felt like I didn't need to, and it was yeah. just wasting my time. Right. I just kept moving kind of right. thing. Right. And, um, and I'm sorry, uh, is it um, French-speaking for the most part, or is it bilingual? It's, no, it's about 50-50 French okay. English, but I went to an English school. You know, it, it, A lot of English people would go. There's one, one of the three schools was bilingual, mm-hmm. if, so if you could go there. But I, I, couldn't, I don't think I could, really handle, I could barely handle the English, so I was going to go to an <laughs> English-French school. So... Um, yeah, so this guy, was, I went to see him. So the reason, he, his, his daughter, I dated her. Um, not really, when we were 13, I wouldn't right, call right, right. very, but we were. He rode bikes we, together. We, we were friends, so he had met me a few times, and I, he knew me. He knew my grandmother, who was a principal at another uh, school. She was actually the first female principal in Ontario. And, and, but um, when I went to see him, he was like, okay, okay, Stephen, we're going to let you come here. You got 
But if you get in if three times, three things, you get in trouble with, you're out. So I was like, okay, sir, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to be good. So the next day, I'm out in the front of the school, and I have this little game. And I, had a, I had a bit of anger management problem, I think. I had this little game. It was an NFL game that my, uh, my cousin had given me. It's like one of the first handheld games. Like right, this was right. a big, but you guys have no idea. We didn't have nothing. We had a so pong game, you know. So, but this was a big deal. It's an NFL First NFL, the official NFL the game. So I'm playing with this guy, grabs it from me, and he's like the local bully guy. He just took it from me. And I was like, you're not just taking it from, not from me. So I threw him through the glass, and it all busted. And then he was speech punching me, and, I, and Mr. Swanson came down, number one, and you're paying for the glass. What? Uh, no, no, nope. <laughs> you you're didn't like, even get to give your side of the story? Nope. There's no side. No sides. <laughs> There's three strikes, Angelo. No sides. <laughs> There's no sides. Then it was like a week later, I decided that I didn't feel like going to this one class, so I went down. There's a, there's a little creek down here below, so we'd go down there so just to smoke and stuff. This time I was down there smoking a joint. Right behind me, tap, tap, strike two. Okay, This, well, is, this like, is going faster than this I is thought. For, this is the first week. And then, uh, then I thought, well, things aren't going well. This not, so I was really good until the school burnt down. Um, <laughs> there said nothing to do with you. No. You didn't burn no, the school no, down, no, right? Perfect. No, was that no. the Okay. Nope. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. Actually, I volunteered to help clean up and stuff, you know? Ah. That's what I did. Nice. We ended up going to, there's only three schools, so now one of the schools had to split the day with us, you know? So we'd go, I made sure I got the afternoon part. Um, <laughs> You're not a morning <laughs> person, I gather. And the classes were only 20 minutes. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. It was perfect. <laughs> but that, yeah, anyways, that's enough of that. All right. So well, I, could, I could tell more on that, but I think it won't. That rest is going to get so worse. So school not <laughs> for you. School's not for you, but you still made it to college. You made it to college, and then you yeah, majored so, in poli okay. So this is what happened. So then basically, this is that school. I'm going 20 minutes a day. Right. Because I had failed every course, I had to take nine courses that year, and I still technically wouldn't have enough courses to graduate. We had grade 13. I don't know if I'd, we had grade 12 and 13. Okay. They don't have grade 13 anymore. That was eliminated, but then they did. So in grade 13, you needed six courses, okay? I was short nine courses to get grade 12. But Mr. Swanson said if I could graduate all nine, that he would make sure I got into college. So if you got a passing grade in all of those classes, yeah. you could still graduate. Yeah, true. And then it would end up happening was I did pretty good, but I was like, it was hard. Like, you didn't have lunch. You know, all my friends, by then you'd have spares. They all had spares. They didn't even have, like, they had three classes. And there was a little pool hall, and they'd be in the pool hall, and I'd be there. I mean, I was pretty good. I went to most classes, and I did very well. And, they're, they're, and actually, uh, it comes time, and he said, well, he, Mr. Swanson said, you're looking real good. And then this one teacher, this chemistry teacher, oh, it's he, always did, a chemistry he, he teacher. didn't like me for some reason. And I got, like, really good marks, but I, I guess I missed a lot of his classes, so he failed me. And, I, I, and I was, I'd already got approved to go to college. I had to wait an extra year to go because of him. But, my, but and Mr. Swanson wrote the letters to each university that I, that I applied to. Just saying that, you know, while he doesn't have this, he did, he got, I did well in the six courses that you really need. Right. And I got into all three uh, places. Did you apply to any um, U.S. schools? No, there's no chance I would have gone. No in. chance? No. No. I mean, not, I mean, also by then, back then, I mean, it was hard to go to a U.S. school. We didn't have, there's no internet, right, at this right. point. So, you, like, the, the ability to even understand what you would try to do to do that. Yeah. Unless you were, like, some, you know, if you had... I thought I was pretty good, but I mean, if you were the greatest football player and they came looking for you, yeah, uh, right. maybe you'd have a shot. Yeah. Wow. So you really meant that when you said, uh, if it wasn't for him, you probably wouldn't be here. It's true. It's true. I have a painting in our bathroom actually upstairs in the, there and it's, it's still there. It's, and he gave it to me. Um, he painted it himself. Uh, he died soon after actually, uh, wow. of cancer, but it's called Charlie's walk. And it's, a, it's about his, his grandfather who was actually a really interesting Canadian Aboriginal person this area called Tomogamy that um, sort of legendary, but it was very inspirational. So you, it's him walking. It, you don't really see Charlie, but it, the whole, it's, you see the sky and you can feel him. That's wow. the idea. Oh. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So that kind of, it sounds, okay, so if I'm tracking that correctly, that you kind of turn a corner there, or at least you understand, I got to do a certain amount of responsibility. You get it you, well, you into know college. What? Basically what I decided was I got to get out of this city, no got matter it. what. If I, if I don't, because that year off was not really good. So I had to take this year and take the one course all over again. Mm -hmm. and so you're probably bored to tears. I was taking bored. I got class. into a lot of trouble that year. So that was a year where I would call that my worst year uh, for me. Like I could have gone any direction and anything could have happened. And I was actually arrested that year. But uh, thank God. Are you 18? Are you 17? I was 18. 18. And uh, turning 19, I, could have, yeah, I was 18. I wasn't 19 yet. 
And then, anyways, it, we got through that and then off to college. And uh, so I was promoting, though, during that time, quite a few shows that would be just basically, we'd, there weren't big bands or anything. Rush wasn't, I got that. After that, there wasn't a lot of bigger ones for a while. Um, and then I would I promote artists from Toronto and, and I do these things. What I did was I realized you can make a lot of money selling liquor. So basically, you could, to get a liquor license, you'd set up a non, I set up a couple nonprofit corporate, well, not corporations, non nonprofit organizations that could apply for a liquor license, okay? Even though I wasn't of age yet. So I had my sister, who was of age, under her name, do that. And then I'd get, I'd do like, so local hall, say 300 people, you know, on a Saturday night, and I'd sell the tickets. I could, it basically became like, you know how, like, you have Insomniac, or you have, like, I had, like it was like my own little brand that was right. going on, so everyone knew to come. And then uh, it didn't really matter who I brought. But if, I don't want to bring shitty artists, but try to do so it was good. But I made it more about the event than it was about I, any one. Yeah, because yeah, I'd read, I, yeah, and that was like you know because for me at the time there was the big promoters that were out there. I just would there was no way to re they wouldn't have a show like this to learn. Um, I just knew from word of mouth because over time you get like it's amazing how without technology and there's no fax machine you figure it out. No, it's amazing how much communication really happened. Oh, okay, right. I actually think in a way there was much like you could have global thought in a way that huh. without anything it was weird. But so I knew about this guy Bill Graham who was a big promoter in San Francisco. He was sort of legendary at the time because I hate Ashbury and stuff. All these artists grew out of there. I mean, to me that was like wow, holy shit! Wish I was there and. Um, so he used to give everyone an apple when they came in the door, right? And the apple had something in it kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was sort of the thing. So it was like promoters, you know? He's thinking how to get people to come. So they, you know, and uh, they want to do that. So because at the time, the artists, they would get flat deals. So it wasn't, it was pretty good. You didn't really have to pay them much anyway. So then agents came along. Because these are fairly unknowns and you're given no, a but platform he, but even, even the big ones at the time, like, you know, when they would come for the, like, into Toronto for the, the big promoters there or wherever, they weren't, the artist was getting not as much money. They would get, here, I'll give you $10,000, and they go play Maple Leaf Gardens, and they sell the tickets for 20 bucks, and they, give the, and they keep all the money. Yeah. Right. That's sort of like, you know, the idea. But obviously, slowly that turned, and every year the artist share got higher and higher and higher. Anyway, so after that year, I went to college, so that's where the next step was college. And um, at that point, the first year, I just partied and partied. I mean, it wasn't really much going on except that. But I want to be the programmer, like the campus programmer. At the time, colleges were a really big deal, and I was now in Ottawa, which is a bigger city than my city. Right. And I thought, well, I, I want to promote here. Like that's what. I, but the easiest way for me to promote, because there was already an established guy like me that would have been in little, my little town, was to tr try to become the campus programmer, which I applied to be, and I got this this job. So I, you'd put on shows, and that was a different time. I. There was like probably thirty to forty shows they put on a year at the college. They don't do Dang. that. They don't do that as much anymore. Dude, you're no. a worker. Yeah. No, but there was, but this, and they did that then, and that, it, it, most colleges had that. Like it was a big deal. That was where a lot of bands broke out of. You know, like I did. You know, a lot of artists would come through. Like in the, this was like nineteen in the early eighties kind of thing, and I would be doing shows with. I did a show with Simple Minds. You know, they didn't even sell out because no one knew who they were. And Flock of Seagulls. Mm -hmm. um, we had like. Frank, Are you catching Frankie. all these people before they're about to? This is just as it's exploding. Just as it's this is, okay. Just as the time, like for me growing up, the music at the, just before that that I listened to, you know, on my way to my, you know, remember my grade thirteen exam for, um, <laughs> it was for what course was that one for? Oh, that one was for the chemistry. Maybe that's why it was. So me and my friend, we went parked the car. He, was, he had a car. I didn't have one. He had an old Datsun B210. It was all banged up. But, <laughs> Perfect. But, but we, would, uh, we, we went and we smoked the biggest joint in the parking lot before we went into the exam. I remember that. How'd you do? I, that's the one I did well. I, got, I think I got 80-something, 80, 80 and they failed me. I think you heard about the joint. And so, then, okay, so you're promoting. You're starting to get your feet underneath you. Yeah, you're doing school because you're supposed to. At what point does this break into, I mean, I know about the Bruce... Well, Springsteen story, but but that's or later. But okay. no, but really the Fill thing. That if you us. go back to the beginning, because really it's really the beginning that matters to me at this point. Yeah. yeah. So when I was so when I was thirteen at the time, and I did that. So you know, I fourteen, fifteen. I would, you know, I, I had my bedroom is in the basement. You know, I just my favorite thing was listening to music from going to pick up these albums, and I would just sit there and I'd listen to like Pink Pink Floyd particularly. I still do. I wish you were here. It was one of my favorite albums. I could listen to it every day, but I sit there and listen to it. And I dreamed that one day I'd live in the Hollywood Hills. That's what I sort of thought and be a promoter. That's what I really did. Wow. Like I sort of knew. I mean, at thirteen. 
I think, yeah, I mean, you don't know, you know, kind of right, thing. Right, right, right. So everything I did, I tried to say, well, because I, I had a lot of jobs and I th in between all those things, you know, even up until I had a lot of jobs, even up until I went to college. Because um, I was always trying to make money, get more cash, do th whatever I could do. Yeah, you're definitely hustling. Yeah, and I just wanted, you know, so I and I tried to get the best jobs. You know, I worked at the pipeline, worked in lumber lumber mill, cut trees. I mean, you know, I did I I did, I did I did I was a butcher. I did all those things because I we know what it did. It made me realize more. I got to get out of here. Mm. Yeah, this isn't what I got to do. What I want to do. This isn't and, meant and for music you. Music was always yeah. always there for me. And when I went to college, I, didn't, I went to college just as a way to get out of out of out of my place. But I think what. With college, I realized once if I hadn't gone there, everything that happened to me in my life is related to meeting people, right? Like, it's not going to school. Yes, it's important to learn. I think you learn more yourself personally, but mm -hmm. but I think what you don't get to do is you don't get to interact with other people and, right. and hear what they do. Right. And then you grow together kind of thing. Yeah. Because even to this day, there's many of those people that I touched at college that were still today are part of my life in different ways and lots in business, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, you know, it's the same for everybody. Yeah. And, you know. And you would have missed those opportunities yeah, well, to form those relationships. Yeah, I'm a little small little place and I got a little bigger place and then there's more people right. and as long as you're open to socially meeting people and stuff. So that's really was important to me. And then when I was there, I mean, School was important, but I really just want. Then music was. I got yeah. something. So yeah, to become the programmer was great. We had we had also we also as that job you also ran the store in the little in our in the one building, and we had a little bar called the Breeze Inn that you were sort of responsible for, and I was also the campus beer rep for Molson at the same time. <laughs> And you I, were like eight hats oh at God. once, buddy. Jeez. So on the campus, I mean, and I, and I, just, and I was a ski rep for the program. You're ski like the program. Swiss Army knife. I mean, of, but of it was diff it was different then. Like you, could, you know, you could smoke in class. You could smoke at college. We could smoke. You know, I, you could not sit there. I mean, you can smoke weed or anything. Right. We could smoke, cigarettes. but you could smoke cigarettes in class. It was pretty disgusting when I think about it. But <laughs> uh, but anyway, we also had to, we also had. Uh, um, a cigarette sponsor deal. You know, you can't have that on campus no. today. No, right. all that stuff no, we no, had. No. So I was like, sh I was like swagged out by so much, you know. Free residence in my job. Free residence, had a bar. Oh, and, then, and all the pinball machines too. Lots of cash in those. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a whole other racket. You, you look like a NASCAR probably walking with promoter hat, <laughs> shirt, I try, band. Well, I try not to do that. I try just not to do that. So oh, okay, you, all yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. You want to be neutral. How does 18, 19-year-old Steve know I was, about, like, Bill Graham and those guys in San Francisco about what was going on? Well, because there is no I, internet. Well, I, no I would go, I would get um, magazines, you know, rolling, like the rolling, old, early Rolling, rolling yep. Stone magazines. There was some, there was things, a thing called Performance Magazine that talked about the promoters back in the day. I mean, I would, there was a lot of charts, which we don't have today, right? Like, right. There, was that, there was a lot more... How you shared information, you'd have to get newspapers and yep. stuff. And there was a little place called Titus in North Bay, and I would, and he could order stuff. So I would find out about it and say, can you try to get this? They didn't, if it didn't have a billboard at the time or whatever that was, there was a lot different. There was other, lots of them. And I would get all these magazines, and I'd learn and read and stuff. So that's all. Did you know eventually that, like you said, your premonition of the Hollywood Hills, did you know eventually you were going to try to get there? No, not like, really. Was California I, like on the map at this point? I mean, or not? not really. I mean, it just seemed to. It seemed that all the artists talked about it. Right, right. Like you know, California, like, yeah. like Led Zeppelin. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I just sounds like a good place to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I hated Florida. Went everybody, the, the Eagles, everybody. <laughs> so yeah, how many songs are called California? Right. So it's sort of like this Mecca, especially. I mean, if you've watched that, I love this, uh, the double uh, show. The, the, the documentary? Uh, Laurel um, Canyon. Yeah, Laurel Canyon. And that's where I live in Laurel Canyon. Yeah. Imagine, I, so I live in Laurel Canyon, so I watch that. I'm like, that? how did I end up here? It's like yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. And even, even today, like Laurel Canyon is very creative. There's lots of creative people there and stuff. And yeah. it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful spot. So take us, if it's okay, what's the, uh, as like we see your work ethic and how hard you're hustling and you're in multiple places, doing lots of different jobs, making connections. What's that next leap forward that, I guess, ejected you to? Well, I went, first of all, I, when I was at college, so I promoted lots of shows. And it took me four years to get a three-year degree, but I was in no hurry because they paid my residence and I could do other things and I was Perfect. promoting. You're making but, more than the professors and, and, anyway. Yeah, yeah, and then <laughs> I was probably. And then, then I ended up, um, we had never really been, I, I took political science, so it was like, it was sort of another passion. I still have that passion, but I'm happy I didn't go that way. Um, but my friend is, was also, he's more active in the, in sort of the local, um, campus. So the first delegate selection was going to be at Carleton, which is the school I went to mm -hmm. and, uh, to for there. And you really, 
how it would work is you would as a you would run as a de- to be a delegate to the in their local club or whatever you want to call it. I think it was called the, the liberal club. It was called the college of the club, and then you would have membership. So because I wasn't interested earlier, or my me or my friend Bob, we didn't have any. There was three hundred members. We didn't have them, so we knew we couldn't win unless we signed up people. And I was the beer rep, so at the local. So we put up a big sign in the lobby. Said, "Come and sign up for Steve and Bob kind of thing, and you get." Um, free beer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true story. And then, anyway, so then... The I, best promotion so ever. I think we signed up Swept four or five... Swept the elections. Five, four or five, yeah, yeah. But we, well, we, we hadn't, it hadn't happened. It was about to happen. And then on the weekend, I guess some of those, the, some of the people on the other that had been there earlier thought we were just assholes and they made it, they went to the press and there was a big national story how Carlton students bribed students for votes. And it was just because those, the other, the people that we were going to beat they right. wish they, they thought of it. They can't believe that we did this, right? And <laughs> they tried to say it wasn't, but we it, we did nothing wrong. Yeah. So it turns out, so we end up it's it, like politics one hundred and one. It was basically <laughs> just a little bad press kind of thing. And then uh, so Bob wins, and then the next day he w- he was actually working for a senior minister just as an intern, and that minister called and said this the guy that was running for to be the PM PM wanted to meet us. So we had meetings. He said, I want you guys to run our youth campaign. This is the kind of strategy we need. So <laughs> it's true. And he became, and he actually won, he became the prime minister very short term because this, you got to get elected still. Right. Yeah. Right. This was when one prime minister quit. Okay. So it's yeah. like, so he, anyways, he, he won and uh, I had an office for a minute in the prime minister's office. And then uh, he called a snap election and was gone. So then I was back. So back to, okay, what am I going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? So then I was, Molson, Molson, where I worked as the summer rep, I liked them because mo- at the time beer companies were really interested. In, they, that's why I got the job. They liked me because they were targeting youth, and and music was something they didn't have because they had a hockey night in Canada and all right. this stuff. Like same with Budweiser. Like everyone yep. all of a sudden realized that like the kids were starting to drink different things. They needed to target youth, um, so they started investing in sponsoring music, and that was sort of like that's an early 1980s thing as well. They did a deal in Toronto um, for a C&E concert series, that same C&E nah, concert. Yep. So it became the, it became the Molson C&E concert series. That was the first, I think it was one of the first big sponsorships. That wasn't me doing that. That was a, the big promoter in Toronto did ah. it. But, but because that was like one of the first years they had this thing called the Juno Awards, which is the Canadian Grammys, um, I just started working for them as a beer rep in a small town just outside of Toronto. And then uh, my boss called and said, look, at, you know, we have this whole table and none of the guys want to go because all these beer guys were old at the time. And they, didn't even, they didn't care to go. So it was with a front row table. And it was not what it is today, the Junos, but it was the first, one of the first years. So all these, if you were Canadian artist, you got nominated to be Artist of the Year, Album of the Year, all this stuff. So I had this table and, I was, and it was the best table. So I knew some of these, who the managers were because I'd been a promoter. So I invited them to sit at my table. And so, you know, there was a guy there, Bruce Allen, that um, managed at the time Backman Turner Overdrive, and he managed Brian Adams and Loverboy, and I knew about him. Like, right. I promoted some of his young, other artists, but he knew, the, he didn't, he, I don't think he knew who I was, yeah. but, but, not, but then he was sitting right beside me. Like he does now. So then I... He bit, heard about your beer so, campaign. So I, so, I had this, so I got this job, and I got this job at Molson, you know, that was, they paid me $36,700 a year, I remember now everything about it and they gave me a car I had a Ford car some kind of Ford a free car kind of thing and I had a thousand dollar a week expense account which was Dude, you're doing better than me what but, year but was this yeah th- this was like 85 kind yeah. Of thing. yeah I didn't last there long because a beer rep was a pretty shitty job you asked me so I take this job I remember and I just wanted to be in music and I was like oh this is awful if I because it's a good job and how old are you right now at this time well then I'd be like 22 23 okay yeah wow. yeah Dude, you, nothing and, the, and that, but this is but, but job in college or right when you graduated? No, I, this is my, I tried. I, I was briefly for maybe a month at the prime minister's office, and I needed to work, right? Right. And at Molson was they were interested in me. I, I didn't. Re- I wasn't really looking for that job. I I sent my resume out to people. To, but yeah. in the music business, where are you going to send it? Your promoter. There's nowhere to go. Right. I don't want. I didn't want to work for these other promoters. Really, like right. You wanted to do your own thing. So now we're around 22, 23, you're, you're a beer rep. And I'm this, so I'm the beer rep, and I'm at the Junos, right? You're at the Junos. You got all that stuff. Meeting right? people, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm at the Junos, the guy's there, and then he says to me, me and my partner, we don't really get along, we split up, we're not splitting up the company, he's going to go become more of an agent, and I'm going to be a manager at the time, they had a little business. And that was quite growing, quite big. And he was. Why do people do that? What's a manager and an agent like? What's the take? Like, why did they split it up? Well, first of all, you have to go back in history. Um, it's just this. It's another gate created by people, right? So you, when, as you get, 
So if you, the real truth about agents is it really became, I mean, man, you can't in California be a manager and an agent. Do you know why? You can't, you're not allowed to you you can't have, do a contract you, you or can't, something? You, you can't be an agent unless you have an agent's license in California. And, and so there's a reason. And so, you know, if you ever read Lou Wasserman's book, um, Lou we have not, but we need Lou, to know. Lou Wasserman started MCA. Oh, okay. right. MCA was a booking agency. He was, he was Ronald Reagan's agent. When Ronald became governor, he had, they, they made this new law that you had to be an agent in order to sell or broker a deal ah. between musicians, artists. You should read the book. Okay. It's a pretty important book for okay. everyone that's in anything to do with entertainment because it's a lot to do with why things exist the way they are. Right. Interesting. Um, so, but, but so I don't know where I was going with so that. So a manager is right? more or less manages oh, yeah. the artist and the agent yeah. can do. Yeah. So but it was so young. Like there was, this, there was no real like functions really yet. You know, yep. I mean, there were certain functions that came out of the MCA stuff because that's there. But that was only in California where right. I was. There didn't have, yeah. but there was, there was agents and managers. But traditionally what happened is they, they followed the California sort of model and and it's, you can't really be a manager for multiple artists because manage, like, you know, I can't just talk to all these people every day. I mean, it's just too hard. So you need someone, you know, if you're, if you're a great musician, you need someone who's going to focus on you and have strategy, unless you're the person that has it. But you still need someone because you need that other person that has a voice of reason. Mm -hmm. Because if you, as you get bigger... Everyone tells you how great you are. They right, don't tell you the truth. So yeah. you always need that person. So, you know, Ray, like Ray, who was the manager of Rush, he's still with him. You know, that's, he's a great manager. Bruce still manages Brian Adams. Um, and there's a, there's a change of management as history goes on. But right. that's what they are. They're, they're, they're sort of part of the brand, but they're the one that's figuring out what to do. And Mick Jagger, in his band, he's both, you know? Kind yeah, of thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of so when you're at this table at the Junos, what – what came of that? What helped so, you? So I met, so, so remember the time. So I was making that money, 36700 36, yep. which is a lot, this is like pretty big money. Have a car. It's, it's a good job for life. Everyone, this is a dream job. You could become a beer rep at the time. Everyone thought the fuck. <laughs> especially, I'm especially in Canada. I, for most I had front row tickets to Bruce Springsteen because none of the old guys wanted them. I had everything. I mean, I, honestly, you, you couldn't have more things. But I didn't, that's not what I could. It wasn't but, your but, but, but I had, aspiration. But I, so I, but I was doing a, in a little local area called Guelph, which would be like, say, you're out in Ontario or something kind of thing. And I wasn't really in the main city. And as a, a beer rep, you had a lot of responsibilities besides, you know, paying off for draft at the club stuff. You had to go and, you know, deal with local problems. And yet, so I had an answering machine. I still have it, actually. <laughs> Because um, I kept it, because all the messages would come in. Hey, there is a fucking mouse in my bottle. I, can I get a free case now? <laughs> kind of thing. That's just the kind of stuff it would be like. And I was like, oh, it's a guy from the Qantas Club. We're having a ball tournament this weekend. I, the guy from Mol Mol Molson's last year gave me all this stuff. I'm hoping you're going to give it to me. If not, I'm going to go to the bat. Kind of yeah. Thing. yeah, everybody's like, seeing what like, they can well, get this, And yeah, I remember, I remember we had the launch of a beer, a beer thing. This was it for me. So, so, and I was just starting. In, I started that job in, say, September, and then it was November. I'm at this Juno Awards, okay? And uh, I meet this this guy, Bruce, and he's like, I didn't, I mean, I knew who he was. So, I mean, it, wasn't, it was all planned. It wasn't like I didn't know what he was doing, but I didn't know that he, him and his partner had just split up and there was an opportunity. So he said, well, my partner just started this agency. Why don't you talk to him? So we set up a meeting and I met him. I flew to Vancouver for this meeting. That They paid half the flight and they didn't pay for anything else. They picked me up and then they offered me a job at no guarantee, like no money whatsoever, but I would get commission on whatever I did. Based on performance. Yeah. So I came back and I quit my job, uh, and then my dad thought I went nuts. Right. That was like, yeah, like yeah. What are you doing? But so I came. But anyways, I moved out there, and I was, you know, I I was doing what I wanted to do, and I signed. You know, part of the deal was Bruce had Brian Adams already as so, a manager, and Brian was already breaking. Like it wasn't like they needed me. Okay, right, they right, didn't right. need me, and and he had a he he had an agent in the U.S., but in Canada he was just doing it himself. Yeah. But I said, well, you got to let me be Brian's agent. If I'm, if I'm going to take no guarantee, i got to be Brian's agent. And he had reckless. It was just blowing up. Because yep. like I, I thought, well, because if you want me to sign acts, i got to be credible. So he, yeah. he, he agreed. And then I signed every act I came across in Canada pretty much. And then, I, then it was very regional. I sort of spearheaded our growth in the country, and we ended up being the number one you know, agency in, in Canada. And then, uh, yeah, and then I was bored. 
<laughs> what's your? Uh, I mean, that's an amazing. That's that's yeah. incredible in its in its own right. But what's that Jerry Weintraub Elvis kind of story where you did with Bruce Bruce Springsteen? Well, that's a different. Yeah. So so now so I'm bored. I'm bored. You're bored. I'm bored. Bored. So now. I'm bored. So in the meantime, there was always one promoter in Canada, and they had owned the company. They, they had owned the company that was the big agency in Toronto, and they were also the promoter. And that was the company that I moved to compete with, and we beat them. In the meantime, at that time... You beat them in signing acts, or you yeah, beat I them took, in promoting no, I, shows? No, no, I was, no, as an agent. I, okay, so I okay. Just, so I remember I'm in Toronto, so I, we'd, become, we'd, become, we'd become the biggest agency, but we, there were other agencies we had to take out or yeah, gobble, con- yeah. just like anything. The, the last final one was the big baby in Toronto. But what had happened was my mom was really sick. She had cancer, and I'd had two kids... And uh, really was uh, flying back and forth. I just made a decision. I was moving to Toronto. And we had a deal with this company where we would be the, we split the country in half and we would split commissions on our artists. But I was sort of done with that. For me, I was like, because I wanted to move to Toronto and I didn't want to work for them. Mm -hmm. So I had a come to Jesus discussion with, at the time, my boss at the time, um, which I, you know, because I didn't have ownership at all of the company. And I was, and all the acts I had signed, you know, except the ones that they obviously hadn't. They loved. So, I remember, you know, we stopped and we went. We're going down to see Garth Brooks because Bruce, his other partners, was managing um, the artist that was opening for Garth at the Tacoma Dome. I'm trying to remember. Oh, what. Tacoma Dome. I'm from Seattle. Right, okay, I said Tacoma Dome. So we're driving down, uh, and so and he's pulled off the highway. And he said, "Okay, I know you want to go to Toronto, and you know you want to keep compete with them, but this is a big step for me because I'm declaring war on people I've worked with my whole life." And I said, "Well, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, but these are these artists are mine, and I'm going to go with you or without you, kind of thing. Like I, mean, I have no choice because I got to make a living." And I said, "You know, I don't want to do that. So you know, if you make me a partner in the company, then I'll." then we'll, um, we'll, that'll be good. So we shook hands and we had a deal. And then I go and we, we won the war. I'm not saying I just, we team won the war. We, 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 we took over we, in three months. I signed all their acts. Wow. And then um, the accountant came in and he said, well, that's not the deal we're going to do anymore. And they offered me this shit deal. And I was like, I couldn't say anything. I had two kids. What was I going to yeah, do? I was yeah, like, yeah. So then I was like, okay, well, I don't know what to do. But in the meantime, this MCA concerts had opened up in Canada, and there's a whole reason for that. I won't go back, and that's a whole story. But they, there was Donald K. Donald and CPI, which is Michael Cole, they had, had uh, control over the market. And MCA had come in because the bat had funded Michael Cole to go get the Rolling Stones and take out Bill Graham. So yeah. this is all ties together. And at the time, so then Mo, this is a beer wars. We, this was so straight up chess. This is beer, but I'm, I'm just a pawn in the game still. In that right. point, you know, so there's a lot going on. In the Question, beer. real quick: When you said the accountant came in and said we're not doing that, accountant doesn't have any authority. They're they're t- no, doing what they're, they're told exa- by somebody. Yeah, even though, even though, yeah, you're late, yeah, we, so we we'll get yeah, 100 percent copy. So, All right. so he's just doing his job, and I like you know I'm freaking out. Like, well, I thought I was getting this, and I'm not getting that, and. You know, I'm Plus after, after, after you just did work. all that hard and, work, and, and yeah, and, and listen, I think I I think I think I was somewhat probably being un- irrational, but I wasn't being rational. Like I think it's in between all of it. You know, you know, things are going on. Um, but by my by fortune, I you know the, the MCA had called me about a year earlier and asked me if I would run a concert company in Canada for them, and I didn't want to do it at the time because I just convinced my team to. I couldn't leave. I told you, like, how could I leave in the middle of this war? I was going to, I'm moving there. We're going to fight the competition. Everyone knows I can't just bail now. Right. So I stuck it out and then I won the war and then we had this thing and then it turns out that the guy that was at MC running the Canadian operation got offered to run the entire operation of MC and he called me and he said, we hired another guy after he didn't take it. He's not working out and uh, we need you. And I said, okay, well, how much do you pay? He said, what do you want? So I gave him a number. He said, yes. So I quit my job at the agency the next morning. I started at MC, and I, that's what I did. Wow. Yeah. I'm As sure. just a concert promoter? Yeah, just pure concerts. So you yeah. lost Brian Adams. You had no more. I was not their agent any longer. Okay. I, okay. I, gave, I let it go. Okay. I let it all go, and okay. they can just have it, and they can keep all the money. Yeah. And I if think. they had actually probably kept their word all the way through, they might. I would never have left. Because yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I also set up this company called Little Big Man. It was in the U.S. out of ITG, which later be, became one of the bigger agencies down here. I mean, I did a lot of things for for that company, but um, 
It was also, you know what? It was time. I sort of done. Yeah. I was tired of the Canadian. I figured I wasn't getting out of this Canadian sandbox unless. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I mean, there was. I was trying to figure. You know, I had to figure out how to get North Bay. I if I didn't get out of Canada, at least in a way where I was connected to something internationally, then I may just be gone. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. So I was for, fortunate to, to 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 get this deal, and then we went on to build the first amphitheater in Toronto. Which was the Molson Amphitheater? So again, all ties into the same people, you know. That's crazy. Beer makes the world go so, so remember what I said, though. So the reason that all happened was because Molson was the sponsor of the CNE. They were mm-hmm. the first one to sponsor. Okay, there's two big beers companies in Canada. There's Molson and Labatt. Labatt's it. So a lot of this ties together because it'll tie together how I end up where I am. Okay, because because Molson were happy that I came to MCA because they knew me. Yeah. So I think that's why they paid me more to do that and then that's where things changed right then because then i was now we were competing against cpi so now i'm competing against the people that own the agency i had to compete compete against they hated me obviously but so you're running the the concert touring for mca just for, just in canada just for canada okay time. but it's still pretty good you know it's 10 percent of the market Huge, it's like yeah. my first promoting real job like besides doing it myself and in that time i promoted like quite a few shows we we did across the country you know, we did um, Page Plant, and I did I did Van Halen's tour. I did Rush's tour. I did. That's where the Springsteen stuff comes in here. So when you do tours like this, now are you pitching them to bring them to Canada? Yeah. Or are they well, like, hey, that's a market we're no, not tapped no, yet. No, we want to go there. No, most of them would have worked with CPI. Oh, okay. Which is the company that was the one that I told you about yeah. that, that was basically set up by Ballard Ballard Colabat and Donald K. Donald and stuff. So th- at the time, they're still there at the beginning, early stages of that. So Michael Cole is the guy you can read about. I mean, he's a legendary promoter. Yeah, read about him already in here. Yeah, so yeah. My, yeah Michael Cole's the one that went down with the bats. Remember, he had, Michael had a deal with Molson. So, the, so he had a deal with Molson, and then when it came time, um, the, he went to Mol- He was tired of his sandbox, okay? Mm-hmm. That's what happened. So he decided, Bill Graham had been promoted. There was no real national tours at that time, okay? There was, Bill Graham was the first guy to do anything, okay, to do that. There's a couple of other ones, I think the Sullivan Group out of Boston that did the Jacksons and complete disaster. Um, but then, you, but Michael had this idea. So he went to Molson and said, look, it, I, I want to do something bigger and I want to I get the Rolling Stones, so I need, I, but I need funding. So, I need, so they said, no, we, are, we already have a deal with you. We don't need to do it kind of thing mm-hmm. so he went and created a company above his company that then didn't have a deal with them they owned his company and so Ballard called bcl and so then he cu- cut a deal with labat who gave him a check for 70 million dollars to fl- so he flew down to montserrat and he offered Mick jagger 70 million i mean that's not exact number so we shouldn't right. remember that right. but uh but but <laughs> a he, lot. A but, lot. but it, at the time it was, no one had done this no one had said i'll give you all this money to an artist right and he did it and it changed the business. I mean, he did change the business, but that, then he was no longer interested in Canada. So that's probably one of the reasons why I was successful, because as he was doing that, I was just built this amphitheater with our company. That was, you know, and there had never been one, which changed. Up until then, his partner's dad owned Maple Leaf Gardens, so the, they had a lock on the arena, so you couldn't promote. Okay, right? Like you're screwed. You can't Anomaly. go in there. So, but this amphitheater changed the dynamic because because the U.S. had already gone to amphitheaters. So almost every promoter had built an amphitheater somewhere. Was that was a big change, because it was the idea was you'd have a venue built for music instead of built for hockey or mm-hmm. basketball mm-hmm. that you could use. That you're trying to yeah. sort of make work for something. Exactly. So then you know so so now I. I I was then, because up till then, all the artists I worked with was pretty much Canadian. You know, it's a Canadian agent, Canadian. So, right. and, and in Canada, they also have what's called, there's Canadian content laws on radio. So they have to play 30 to 40% Canadian music. So there was a Canadian star system that existed that didn't really mean anything else anywhere else. Does that ex- exist today? Still does, okay. yeah. But it's less meaningful because they all, everyone's found ways around it to, to right. do it. So he's, Justin Bieber's Canadian. You know, yeah. Drake is Canadian. Yeah. I mean, they don't, you know, you have, there's so many Canadian artists. Yeah. It's crazy. But um, what ended up happening was, you know, I, I think my eyes really opened up still just before all that. This is when you know, I was an agent for, for Brian, when, but going back a step. So mm-hmm. I had not an MC. But I definitely was, my last year as an agent was really opening me up. And I think when MCA, that was the MCA thing. When it did happen, I think it was destined to happen or something because I had brokered the deal for MC, MCA couldn't get any acts against CPI. And Bruce Allen managed Brian Adams, and I was the agent, even though I had no real power. I was sort of in, 
entitled. But, but yeah, I was, but you had the relationships. I, I had a relationship with th- some things, but they didn't really need to meet. They didn't. And Bruce didn't. This was the first time he was going to have to pay me, did I? The first time uh, <laughs> he paid me, but but um, I don't think he liked it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Freeze but, always uh, more agreeable. But but, than... but, he, but so I think the reason I got the job at MCA was I helped broker Jay's deal to get Brian away from CPI, and that was when Brian had waking up the neighbors with a song called "Everything I Do I Do for You," which was produced yeah. by Robert Mutt Lang. And that year, um, Bruce from the Robin Hood soundtrack, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they, so Bruce said, "Why don't you come to England?" Because he just you know, so, so I went with was another guy, um, Joe Summers, who was ran ran A and M Records at the time, and that's where Brian was signed to. And Joe, so me and Joe flew over um, to there, and they had the promoter picked us up. I've never been to. I mean, it's my first trip out of the country, really. Not I'm in the U.S., but I've never been to overseas. Europe, yeah. And uh, we get picked up and take the thing. And, and, and Adams was doing like, I think it was six nights at Wembley Stadium. It was like massive. Like, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, this is around 90, right? Yeah. yeah. So, it's, but this is his biggest record that Cobain. he had. So he, so he goes, yeah. And, and so um, we end up going there. And I was like, I'm thinking, holy fuck. And they're singing like his songs. And they're singing like, I think I've never experienced this situation where. Like 100,000 people. It, it, yeah, yeah. And they're singing like, you know, Summer 69. And they're singing like even his other records. And I was like, holy shit, this is so big. So I was in. So then I really wanted to go. So I think part of when I left, even though I was mad, it was also because I wanted to go. Like I just, right. it was, and I, and I think, so I blame him, but it's probably not just that, you know, kind yeah. of thing. Right. Yeah. We still got to get to that that Bruce story. <laughs> Let's well, comment in this zone because now I'm at MCA. Okay, um, so you got to get the big acts to Toronto for this amphitheater that you helped yeah, create. Yeah, but I have a bigger like now. But I'm tied to this company called MCA. It was actually called and it became Universal because Universal bought like it became Universal, and then it was like it, to everyone it was the biggest company in entertainment. So my card was like pretty good. So when I was from the time I was like uh, in college, I guess even yeah, I was college. I always wanted to promote Bruce Springsteen. Like he was, he was sort of happening, but they used to have this thing that the agents would call promoter of record. They still have it. It's bullshit, man. It's <laughs> fucking bullshit. <laughs> so, so that's why I don't, I don't really, don't really believe in agents anymore, even though I was one. But yeah, uh, <laughs> they, they're blockers. You know, they block you. So they, yeah. so they say, so well, you were the first guy to do it. You did it when it was high school, so you get to do it forever. And I'm like, that really seems stupid to me. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't seem like a fair deal. Yeah. I mean, well, it doesn't seem like it's good for the artist either. If you right. ask me, I mean, right. if you're, you know, sort of thing. So I would call, I'd call this guy Barry every, like every year and probably sometimes more than that and say, hey, can I get, he says, well, they still, you know, they got history there sometime maybe. And this is for like from college on. And now, I'm, now I'm in so college. Wait, you're calling him what, once a week, once a month? Well, at first it was once a week. And then he got sick of me, so I had to stop. <laughs> and then, um, the, and then I stopped really calling him, I guess. I mean, I didn't really call him anymore after a while. It was, now it's like, I've, at this point, this was in college, so I was like in the early 20s, and now I'm in my 30s. And a call comes one day, and he's like, it's your lucky day, Steve. Um, there's a bit of a problem. Bruce, you're going to get some Bruce Springsteen dates in, in Canada. I said, well, I said, well, there's Michael Cole got in a little trouble. There's a story that says that he was using the tax money. That he, got, he didn't have to pay the 10% tax mm-hmm. and all this stuff. And I'm not going to get into that whole thing. You can yeah, that's it okay. Um, but uh, I know you called so much, so we w- want you to be the promoter. And he, and I, he said, well, how much? He says, no guarantee. Now, this wasn't a Bruce Spring- This was after he's done The Born in the USA. He put out a record called Ghost of Tom Joad. And he wants to do a solo tour. So it's a solo tour. Oh, and, so this is an E Street band. This is just no, Bruce this is, by himself. This is after he's had the big tour. So I said, that's awesome. So I'm excited. So I do the same thing normally. So, you know, there was going to be three shows, really. Two in Toronto at the Massey Hall, small theater. Like we've been playing like, you know, the Orpheum downtown or something here. And then Montreal at the St. Denis Theater. And so they're not big, but he's just playing acoustic. Okay, it's a big deal. Yeah, but the seeds you had planted ten years yeah. earlier calling yeah. are paying. Yeah, off but the now. best yeah, the best thing happened. So so I don't I, I mean I don't really it's a, it's great that I'm getting it, but it was not like it wasn't big financially, but it's still from the Bruce Springsteen check right. kind of thing. So I I'd range so I'd get this guy Mike that did all my um you know, ran my security stuff and did, you know, Range pickup and visas and stuff. I, so I normally sent him to the airport to make sure they are. So then Barry calls me and said, why is that guy going? You got to show up there. So I show up. I show up. I have a used, like, um, uh, Jeep, like a <laughs> Cherokee with dented. 
I pull out, so I'm there. So I, and at the time, is obviously before all 9-11 and all this way early. You could actually go in the airport and stuff. So I yeah. went to the airport, and I was told to hold a sign just with my name on it, Steve. Okay? Steve. Okay? So then he came, and he, uh, he came with, with another guy. His, the other guy's name was Terry. It was a friend of his uh, that he grew up with, and he was just traveling with Terry. The, this tour manager, who was still his tour manager, was already in town. He was already at the venue and stuff. And he was staying at the Four Seasons in Toronto. I had already went in and got his key to his suite and everything. So he, when we got to the hotel, he would just be able to just walk right in. So we get we gets in the Jeep, and I'm, I'm trying to talk to him. And it's like, it's sort of weird. He's sitting right beside me, and Terry's in the back seat. And I'm like... I got Bruce Springsteen sitting in here. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what else. And he's reading. He's reading the Wall Street Journal. And I'm like, fuck. It seems weird. He's reading the fucking Wall Street Journal. What's he looking? At? What's he looking for? I mean, and so, that, so I'm. I'm. Everything I say Checking is stupid. Everything I say is stupid. I'm guaranteed. What's the Chris Farley bit where he interviews the uh, the uh, famous people and he has no. He doesn't. He can't come up with any good yeah, questions. Yeah, you know, it's no, like no. it feels yeah. like that. Okay. Well, it feels like I, I, everything I say. Yeah. That, yeah. So like, you like to read the no, newspapers? So then, so then I start talking. I said, Well, I'm going to tell him about Canada. I said, You know, we should do a full tour of Canada. You should go to Newfoundland, man. You can see the ice flows in the thing there. <laughs> He's, he's looking at me. He doesn't say much. I mean, he's, he's not saying. He's, he's like, I'm trying, and I'm saying everything I say. I realize this. I'm sounding so stupid. I can't. I, so now we're driving down to the the Hunt Valley Park. We go up the, the, the University Avenue, and I'm taking drop in the four seasons. I have the key. I've handed it to him. We put, pull in. There's, and this is like, he is. He's big. Like he's big. Like I don't realize. So there, there's like people on the street. There's all kinds of cameras. I pull up in front. Here's the key, and he's like, um, uh, "I'll see you tomorrow." More. I said, I said, "I said I'll see you tomorrow." He says, "We're not having dinner." I'm like, I'm having dinner? So I'm like, uh, I thought we were going to have dinner. So, he's, so he, he, I said, okay, I haven't made a plan for dinner, so I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do now. So, <laughs> so the, you lie and go, of no, course we're no, having so, dinner. So I, ha I know there's a little really good Italian restaurant right in this little like, ho hovel. Like, there's a church there, and there's like a little walkway. Yep. So it's a pretty hot spot. So I, I don't really have any clout there or nothing. I just decided to go. I said, well, you guys go upstairs and get ready, and I'll meet you back down here, tent. So I go over to that restaurant and I said, could, could you get us in? I'm with a very important person and I need a table that's, you know, sort of for not to, like, he doesn't want to, as I, he told me not to be in the height, he didn't want to be in a corner. He told me. So he, he said, don't or do? He didn't want to be stuck in a corner, oh, but he okay. didn't want to be too f in the middle. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know what that means really, but I, so I say that to them and they get a table. So I go back. We, he doesn't want, so he walks out the paparazzi. He's really nice. He signs everything, talks to them. We're walking over. We go in the restaurant. We sit down. What I don't know is, that there's a CREA board meeting happening in this restaurant. So CREA is the Canadian Recording Industry Association. It's like the it's like your Grammy Association, but it's the Canadian version. So every so every record company every record company president is sitting at this table right there, and I sit down with Bruce Springsteen. Okay, and they know it's Steve from. Did you just wave at him like, well, "Hey guys"? So I, I actually introduced him to his the president of the company he signed to. Okay. <laughs> Who he doesn't know. Doesn't know yeah. So they don't really know that I've just. Do you go jogging and trip and fall on winning <laughs> yeah. auto tickets or anything like that? I, oh, I can go back to that. But listen, <laughs> um, but, um, but, 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 so they don't really, they don't know what I'm, they don't know that yeah, I don't, don't really know them. Don't tell they, them. They, they Let still, them assume. They still don't know. <laughs> Fake it till you make but that, it. But all of a sudden that changed the, the, the perception of all the labels in Canada, which were, they had more control of artists. And so international artists coming. They usually, the label had a lot to say, but today it's not like that. So it just, all of a sudden, that's how I really started winning because everyone thought, like, I must be really plugged in. And, 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 and when you're in Canada, you know, it's like living, you know, anything that happened in America was a big deal to you because it's the big boys, you know? That's, right. how you, that's what you thought. I, I, had I known how simple it would have been for me to come here, I would have just come earlier and I'd be way further along. But you were sort of, as, as a Canadian, you were living beside a giant, you know? They came like you know we had the CFL and the CFL used to play as part of the with the AFC and NFL. But when the NFL emerged, we didn't have a team because of television rights because there was Canadian right. broadcast rights. Yeah. So all the things that protected your country hurt your country in the yeah. end, real mm -hmm. sort of thing. Anyways, huh. Aside, just just talking about icebergs one day and then just yeah. sitting with Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, no, no. The next day, so then at the end of the night, he's like, um, "I'm going to see you tomorrow." I said, "Well, you see me at the show." He says, "Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind working out." So my my friend. Had a big house with, you know, private and nice area. I said, well, I'll get a He says, well, where do you work out? I said, well, I just go to Gold's Gym. And he says, where is this? It's right around the corner from here. He said, well, why don't you just come over and walk over? So I went to the hotel and we walked over. I mean, I pulled into my gym and everyone sees Bruce Springs. They don't really realize it's him right away. And then all of a sudden he's like, 
Holy shit. How much Those does he bench? Are, he's got an American flag he's strong, bandana he's on. Were you, were you trying to like keep I, up with I, it? I, I know. He, he went on his own. Like in the gym, he just went on his own. Like he just yeah. wanted their thing. You know, he's, he's very like, he's very much right down to doing his own thing. I, at this point though, I have a job too. Like I got shit going on. I got to yeah. go back. So, so then he wants to go look at vintage clothes. I said, well, you got the wrong person. I don't know. So I, there was actually my marketing person. She was really into vintage. So I saw, I, I got her to come meet us at the gym. She went and waited at the hotel and she took him shopping. Yeah. So what year is this? Because this is he wants to watch what the Toronto Raptors. Who who are the no, basketball? What's was, the basketball team? It was the Ra- it was the Raptors playing playing. They were playing. I think the New York New one of the New York teams. So this is like ninety four ninety five. Like when, yeah, I think that's in, when the Raptors started. Because, right? Yeah, ninety seven is one. Yeah, it would be in the ninety four ninety five. Could have been yeah. ninety six. Okay, in there, right around there. You could. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a blur, but something. There. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I'm just yeah. trying to think when the Raptors actually had a team. I'm well, they like had no they, mid '90s, right? Yeah, because they didn't have. You're right. They were playing at the Sky Dome at the time. I think no, maybe not. The Sky Dome was like they were, they were played in our and our initially when they played there they played in a big stadium and they put right. it, they converted for basketball and then there was a Maple Leaf Gardens and then there was an arena built. Uh, the Air Canada Center, Air Canada Center, yeah. Scotia Bank Arena. Um, yeah, it was built. I, I can't. I can't remember. All that. So we got we got probably about another maybe 15, 20 minutes okay. left. I would love to get from we oh, haven't Bruce, gone very far yet. Bruce, <laughs> uh, hey, <laughs> we'll do two parts then. Okay, keep so me. Bruce, kind of that whole serendipity. It was more that that, that I, blows the doors off. Well, for I mean, you. They, like I mean, it did, I didn't really realize it really, but it was a perception, right? Perception becomes reality on everything. Right. Like if I don't you, if, you be, if you have one fucking hit, you have a hit. You know? Yeah, yeah. Now what you do with the hit is up to you. Yeah, and you had a hit. You had Bruce in the middle. I was. Of the I had a couple of hits in the, before then, but this, Brian I Adams. Find, I mean, but Brian Adams at that time. That Brian was Adams, a huge song. Brian Adams without Brian Adams. I also, if I, you know, I mean, with even before that song. I mean, that song was mega big. But, but summer '69 was huge. But but you know, it was like a calling card. Like it's like you know, yeah. like if you have a movie, you, you you have the number one movie for a minute kind of thing. If you yeah. if you don't take advantage of the number one movie at the time, you, you're going to forget it. You got to go. Yeah, so you gotta. Yeah, I have to have a plan, and I think I was someone had a plan, but I didn't expect it all. You know, kind of thing. I basically, it's an, like I've, you know, MCA concert. So I, well, first, I mean, I can, I, I could make it. I could take all responsibility. I took out the agency. It became the number one agent. Then I became took over all the. We bought the promoter, so BCL, which was Ballard Cole Labats. They had a company. We competed with it. We end up, they we took out all. The, they'd been there for years and years, and we ended up beating them. Um, and we bought them out. But it wasn't we beat them too. Michael Cole had decided to leave. He wanted to be a big promoter, so he now has the Rolling Stones. And he's doing U2. And he's got moved his operations offshore to, like, uh, okay. Bermuda. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, the, and, my, and there's a guy through the whole process, another related back to Brian Adams. Um, when Brian, uh, between two records at one point, I had an offer come in from a promoter that um, – was a sort of an independent promoter. That's when I was an agent still back. This would be a 93, I'm thinking. Okay. Before before I've, maybe earlier than that. I can't, I, timing's, it's, I'm still an agent, okay? Right. And the Bats is backing this promoter and they're doing a show at Can Olympic Park. When was the Olympics in Calgary? Yeah. The yeah. following year. It may be, it, it, so after that year, so there's, they built this whole Can Olympic Park and they thought it turned into a concert venue. So this promoter had got an exclusive and he offered Brian to, to play and it was between rec- it was between Reckless and Into the Fire or after Into the Fire which wasn't the most successful record and so Brian didn't really tour on that record and, and but he offered him $500,000 to play and that was 500000 would be like today like a million five probably in that kind of zone so right. it was a lot of money so Bruce said are you sure about this we should do it and I'm like yeah and he, and he said well how we know we can get paid I said well the bats is backing it so he told me to get um this guy Jay Whiteside on the phone, who was the running running marketing for Labatt at the time, and and, and he, they were sponsoring. Bruce Allen had a race car too, so Bruce was sort of schmoozing him too. Mm-hmm. But so, but he didn't want to be respond like he wanted to make sure it was all good. So on the phone, he said, "Jay, I just want to make sure that we're good on this. Well, we'll do this date. You're telling me for sure, you know, that you're back in the date no matter what, because I can't get Brian to do this and have it be a disaster. Right. Well, we go on sale. Thing the thing sells out. But all of a sudden, there's there's all these legal papers coming about garnishing the box office and stuff. This promoter that has had not paid all the bills for other artists that he played, so it was a shit show. And now Brian's name was in the middle of it, and Bruce hated it. So he told me to get Jay back on the phone. So we get him back on the we get him on the phone. And he says, "Jay, it's now going to be a free concert. You're going to refund all the money, and you're going to pay all the costs. And Brian's playing for free." 
So that happens. So so and, like drop. So 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 Labatt agreed. They, they agreed, and then they sent this guy. They they sent this person, two people, to come to settle the show with us. Like they had to pay the bills, and uh, one of them is is the guy with became that is now my boss but at the time he was a young Labatt guy and uh, he became my partner later it was interesting. do most music reps come out of the Labatt company or at I mean or beer, 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 beer in general, general? But, well not normally but in, can <laughs> in Canada these for whatever in reason Canada, in does. Canada the, the beer was basically beer is Labatt and Molson just pushing pushing Some Coke and Pepsi no, no, look, no listen I, I used to do these things called blind dates where we'd put these band we'd put the, you'd, you'd win in cases of beer stuff you know that was when I was at that was at an MCA when I was there we did like we did actually Soundgarden, you know, David Bowie, Bush, um, No Doubt, Rush, a Metallica in the club. So you'd go, you, you would be, you'd win a, in a case of beer, so a little coupon, and you get to go to a show. It, you wouldn't know who's playing. And you'd go in there and Metallica would play. It was a pretty big deal. That's, that's a huge deal. Yeah, then we did. Yeah, then, then it's it, like winning the lotto. Then, but that was in, in, in my, in, in Mike, uh, Michael now, um, he, had, he had done the same thing at Labatt. So he, he had, I had set up my own company. What happened was, Psych okay, MCA. Everything's going well. Spring Everything's team, going well. We're back done. to MCA. And then um, a really good friend of mine became one of the biggest, you know, financiers and bankers in Amer in Canada, in the world, okay? In about three years, he started this thing called securitization. And, you know, was from zero to there, like a billion, okay? Flying in jets and it was crazy. So he kept saying to me, why don't you start your own company? Why are you working at MCA? Let's start your own thing. So he, and, and I created this festival called Edge Fest, that I turned and I put it on the tour and we made a million dollars. And that year I got my bonus, it was 10 grand. And I was like, I'm just not happy. I mean, this seems ridiculous. So then he saw that and he said, well, I'll just, he, he funded a company. And uh, just after I funded it, I was at an event and it was sort of public that I was doing this and going to compete with my company. And this guy, the, Michael Rapino, he was at this event at the Junos, which has now grown into a bigger deal. Right. And we were in Vancouver, and he saw me there, and he came up, and he started talking to me. And we've known each other since that settlement at the place right. where lightning hit the stage, and the water was pouring in the building, and we're settling. But there's that whole thing there. We'll come, we don't need that. And so basically, <laughs> he, we remember each other. And, and, uh, we, and, and he's like, he knows who I am. I know he, and so at the time, the other thing that happened, we, when we were competing against BCL, they sort of caved because, because, because Michael Cole – Fuck, well, fuck them too. I shouldn't say that, but he did. He and so it. Labatt's was pissed. So then we bought Labatt's piece of BCL at Molson. And Molson and Labatt's were tired of wasting their money. So they probably, it was a way for them to both stop spending money crazily on music. This plot uh, is like on the level of Game of Thrones. Just Well, wow, that stuff, I mean. There's a good. lot of acronyms too we're going to have to describe. I mean. <laughs> LCI, BCL. I mean, there's a, there's a story about that whole thing. There is. It's a big thing. But, um. At the time, anyway, so we had bought the rights for the, the remnants, I call it, the remnants of assets, because we didn't sell the, we didn't buy the company, we bought the assets of the company. Right. And then with the assets of the company, we got all the, they couldn't, they were basically excluded from promoting. And Rapino, who, he was the guy at Labatt, so yeah. he was handled their, all their music rights stuff, so the deal was really cut with him. So he knew a lot about what I, me and he, I knew a lot about him. And we, and we ended up being partners, and we started a little company called Core Audience Entertainment. Um, we were, our idea was to consolidate concert companies. You know, that was what we were going to do. We went down to Boston and, uh, you know, I give it credit to him because I think I would have blown the meeting, but we raised 250 million in our first meeting. And then we started to try to put offers up. That was the time Sillerman was doing his old roll up. We didn't anticipate that. We, we, I thought I was really, con we were really kind of thing, but we were offering like three to four times multiples. To, we were going to consolidate all the local promoters, but he had just done the, the clear channel deal himself and in the Mays family backed him and he bought like spent two billion like we had 250 we were out you know right wow. so in the end they bought they end up buying us and uh he's now the ceo of live nation though yeah rapino is mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. my boss so the yeah. guy from labats and you were at molson is now tony we need to get i think he's because i'm at molson that's why i'm not I, yeah uh, I'm we need to start here. drinking different <laughs> that's what we I'm, need to do. I'm not being interviewed at cnn beer. i'm not I, i'm not on i'm not cnbc he is on <laughs> yeah it's all good. And he's from, North, he's from Thunder Bay and I'm from North Bay. Oh, Thunder Bay. Yeah. Hockey. Yeah. Um, one story that I read about in your bio that we did not talk about yet was the Getting Prince's song on the radio. Uh, that was like a 14-minute song that you got on for six, seven, eight minutes. And then yeah. it, it became a huge relationship with you and Prince. Yeah. Was that for like a 
via concert touring? Well, not really. I mean, what happened, first of all, I, I was at MCA. Um, he was the artist formerly known as Prince, and he, had, you know, he was really... The symbol. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know him then, but he, he, he they ended up... He had, this guy called me, this guy, Billy Sparks, who worked with him, and he's like, um, we wanted... Prince wants to tour this, can we? but they want to start in Toronto. I didn't know why he wanted to start in Toronto or anything, but I guess he had started seeing this, this woman from Toronto. And so they played at this, the, this we set up, a, it was just a club thing, and, and we paid for their pre-production because they were going to rehearse and then tour. Uh, and I was, going, I was going up north to my cottage, so I wasn't even going to the show. It turns out then my production guy said, well, they left and they didn't pay the rehearsal costs, which were 250 kind of thing. And I was like, this is still at MC, I'm at MC then. And I'm like, oh my god, this is crazy. What am I going to do? Because like, like I, I'm sort of responsible for this situation. Right. So we finally were able to get the money. It took a year because he, I figured, well, he's going to play one of the MCA venues in America. So, I, so, I had, so we just waited and waited until he played one. He played Universal, yeah. And we took the money back. So that was that. And, and, and so he called me. You have to take it all right now. That's the first time I talked to him. <laughs> um, and then he didn't really connect the whole. We didn't know. I didn't know him or right. anything. And then. It was a few years later, I had left MC and started my own company, Core, and uh, we were promoting shows and stuff, and he would come to the shows all the time. He would come, always come and want to see shows, and I, I finally I said to him, well, not to him, to Trevor, it was Trevor's friend, who was a security guy, I said, Trevor, I'd really like to meet him, kind of thing. If he wants to come to the shows, I've like, got all these tickets, can we meet him? So he, he asked me, Trevor said, well, he'll meet you tonight at 2, 2 a.m., 2 a.m.? I have... <laughs> I'm like, I have two little kids in Salo, and I was like, that's really late, man. And we said, well, that's 2 a.m. It's called the Red Door. It's in Toronto, this little club. At the, and, it, and so I go, and it's downstairs. And it's not, I mean, I've never been there. So I go there. It's like a Tuesday night. And um, he's sitting on a little stool, you know, like a stool, just a chair, a stool. Well, he has a chair. I got a stool, a little table thing there. And I come in, and there's, there's it's like half full of the club. It's, not, it's, not, it's like smaller than this room. And he's like, um, uh, don't say anything. And he takes out from his pocket, he hands a CD to Trevor, and he says, Trevor, go put it on. Basically, not speaking, put it on. So he hands it to the DJ, <laughs> and the DJ plays the song, and it's like, it's just a jam song and everything else. So I'm like, I don't know what he's doing, kind of thing. And then... You're just sitting there so not talking, so he, listening. Yeah, so he plays the song. And then I try to talk to him. So then, and so then he's, let's go. So we leave. We get in this, he's got a big white limo at the back, and we go... He said, I want to hear the song because I want to see what you can do with the song. He doesn't even know what I, I mean, he clearly doesn't, we don't, he doesn't know me really. He doesn't yeah, right. know what I do. Um, but he's like, can you get this on the radio? And I'm like, well, play it again. So they put it on. So I'm timing it. It's 14 minutes or something. I'm like, ah, it's going to be pretty tough. This is when Backstreet Boys are happening. Kind of oh, stuff, okay. Right. Okay, like the grunge is gone. Backstreet Boys. Yeah, I, I did the first Backstreet Boys. Degrees, in well, sync. I did the first Backstreet Boys shows in Canada with this other guy. Like they broke out of there, but this was all after Nirvana. I had Nirvana and stuff, and and I was I missed the grunge thing. I I missed the whole scene. I Kurt Cobain used to sleep at my house, but I missed the entire scene because I had Loverboy and stuff like that, you know. So, but so now we're sitting there and he's playing a song, and I'm like, I can't get this thing on. So he drops me off at my house in the limo, and. This is like, say, 3 a.m. at this point. And then at about 6 a.m., the door, door bell rings. My son, I guess, was down. And he's like, I think he's six or seven, I don't know, at the time. And he says, there's some guy at the time. And it's Prince at yeah, 4 no, it's not, one. No, it's not no, Prince. No, it's his bodyguard. No, it's his bodyguard. Oh, bodyguard. Oh, it oh, no, it's a big guy. It's a big guy at the door. <laughs> I go to the door, and, he, he, and so Trevor says, Prince worked all night since you saw him on this. He hands it to me. And it's now eight minutes long. He's edited it. He said he edited it for you so you could get it on. So I'm like, okay, I'll see what I can do. So at the time, because I had the Backstreet Boys were happening, this is why the, the, the there's a, a station called Kiss FM had grown. The, 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 this station, most the biggest station, there was new, Kiss in New York, there was Kiss in LA, Kiss in Toronto. It was like Kiss, and so uh, they I was working with them because they were promoting my Backstreet Boys shows. And so I I said to them, we need to get the song to play. You got to do me a favor, Julie. It was Julie and Chuck. I said, Julie, please do it. She's like, ah, oh, man, okay, we'll do it. I said, well, when do you want to do it? She's well, he's flying apparently today to Minneapolis. He's coming back tomorrow, so I need it. Five, around 5, I want you to be able to play it. So I'm going to tell Trevor, so he's in the car, and we put it. So they do, Smart. So they do this great thing, and they, 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 the world global premiere of the ne first. Never been heard of. Yeah. No, but this is the time, because he agreed. The thing I told him is you have to call it Prince. Instead of a, so the, the debut of the Prince first Prince release since 
before or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So it comes on the radio, and it really doesn't fit the format at all. It's basically a jam song. It's not really good, but it doesn't matter. So she, she calls me. I play this. You got to play it all weekend. Just hammer it. Oh, so she ha- so they, agree, they agree to do it. And so I'm sure it just stood out. Like, if you're a listener, like, I mean, you're like, like what is this? Like, here's Christina Aguilera. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and also this. So then. What did that cost uh, you? Just some tickets to back Yeah, they, no, they needed more tickets uh, for promo. Okay. It didn't cost me anything, really. Oh, okay. that was easy. That was easy. <laughs> so then, uh, so then Trevor called me and said, well, Prince wants to meet today. So that day we met. At 3 a.m. again? No, no, we met. That, <laughs> it, no, we met about 11 p.m. That was about 11 p.m. And it was just out of his car, and it just in the car. And he said, "Okay, I'm ready to go on tour. I want to start next week touring, like next week. I'm talking next week. Like so, I booked the tour for the next week, and then he went on the road, and we sold out the shows, just smaller shows. And then I ended up bringing him to Europe. You know, it was the first time Prince went to Europe for many years, and that. You know, from then, you know, I worked with him." Since I mean, on and off, he fired me quite a few times, but but getting that album on the radio what, did that that built the trust. That it, was what like. Well, I I did what I said I was going to do. That's all it was. That's all it was. Um, you know, they, he was mad at his label, usually mad and bitter, like a lot of people, because you know he was told he had a hundred million dollar record deal. We never really got the hundred. I mean, that's the gross. So everyone tells you what the gross is, right? They so these artists think they have a hundred million. Like they don't really know that after you take all the costs and you pay for everything, it's you, five. Exactly, and so, you know, whether he should understand or not, he didn't, or just like any other artist, okay? Yeah, so right. they, be, they come, become very bitter, so um, I think he just appreciated that I would tell him exactly what, I, what, 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 the, what it was, and he didn't like it lots of times, right? Like, he didn't like yeah. it, but, but he would get mad at me, and he'd tell just, I'm going to get someone else, and he did it, but I never got mad. I just would wait. You know, I ended up doing 21 nights here at the Forum at one point in time, and... Um, did the 10 nights in New York. I mean, I probed him all through Europe, did lots of crazy things. I mean, he was difficult, but I learned a lot. So you had Prince when you owned Core. I started then. Right. And then I promoted him before then. I promoted him at MCA, that first thing I did. Got I did it. But he has, there's no connection really to that. That no. became a okay. different thing because he never met me. He okay. Didn't, he didn't really know me. And then it was at Core, and then it was went on, and we did the, we did the European tour. I, we didn't get the U.S. tour, and there's a reason. It's like it, it, t- t- that would be another hour to explain. <laughs> um, but we'd but, love to have you back yeah. for part two. Yeah. But, but that part was really the part where, you know, I love promoting Prince, even if it didn't make money. It was a guy that inspired me when I watched him perform, and that mm-hmm. was the best. I mean, I miss him today. Like I think, he, yeah. Like at least he stood for some he stood for real art he didn't like he hated this music that we have today like he wanted real musicians mm-hmm. and uh you know he would push you beyond like always like everyone you know what you were the band if you were the guitar player the drummer i mean he worked these guys but yeah. he was a, you know he had a level that he would but see he, was, he played like how many instruments like every instrument seven or eight at he least. played every instrument i mean he played like we did the shows at, at, at Madison Square Garden with him, and um, uh, Welcome to America right. kind of thing. And uh, Madonna came to the show. She wanted to sit in a certain thing, and I had arranged for the management. Had asked me to get her a nice these seats, but he wanted her to sit in a certain spot. He made so I made sure her tickets weren't where they supposed to, but <laughs> supposed to be. So she's right down by the stage, and he he really did do this. He came over. He this is like. You know, show three or something, and she's there, and he, he, um, he's on the stage, and he comes over because it's a symbol stage, so he, he, things move around. I don't know if you've ever seen, if you're aware of no. that, but it's, no. in the, it's in the round, and he could, so he had this, had the, he would, he came over and he played guitar, and whatever, and then he'd come and sing, like you know, something. Then he'd come over with the piano and do Purple Rain right in front of her. Then he would dance to one of his songs, and then he grabbed the bass and played the bass, and then he danced, <laughs> and he looked at her and he said, "You can't do that. Come on." Oh. I swear. <laughs> yeah, true. What did she do? Leave the building. <laughs> <laughs> Not right away. She did. She was smart enough to be like cool about it. But she, as soon as she had her moment, she got up and left. Wow. She never took the crystal room. <laughs> right. That's for sure. Just. So after core, you was that when you went after so core? When does Live Nation come into this? Well, core. So Live Nation. So okay, think about this. So core got sold to SFX. So Core was sold to SFX, which then became Clear Channel. So SFX was the company that consolidated everything. Mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. we would, I was Michael and I were trying to consolidate. We lost, so we ended up cutting a deal with them. That was at least the second thing, best thing we could do, I guess, maybe the third. But um, 
we do that. And then, so I'm the president of Clear Channel in Canada, I guess you want to call it. And then Michael decides, he, he got offered a, jo- a job, a really big job to stay and go back to Labatt. He didn't want to do that. He always wanted to be in music. So he, I mean, give, he took, I mean, he just really wanted to do it. He moved to New York and took a job that was really junior. I'm talking like, I can't, are you sure you're okay with it? Like, you're going to do this? But he did it within six months. He moved to Europe. Within about another six months, he was CEO of Europe, then CEO. And he, he took the company public later, like from Clear Channel to Live Nation. Oh, wow. And he's just a brilliant businessman. So, yeah. I mean, I was fortunate to get him as my partner because I think had that not happened, again, another story. Again, another door open. Another, yeah. another person in yeah. your life that changes your life. Like, I mean, yeah. it was yeah. like... I don't know that we would have raised the 250 because I don't know in that meeting in Boston at the time and yeah. that I don't think I would have sold it through without him, yeah. you know, kind of thing. So probably things would be different. Um, I don't know how you got actually ended up because the whole Laurel Canyon, California, how we brought it back to the beginning. Mm-hmm. Is that just when you went to Live Nation and now that's the, this is you're here? No, I mean before. So I left. I had to for personal reasons. I left Clear Channel and um, I ended up. Uh, just buying a part of a company called the agency group, you know, so I sort of had no choice. I had to make a decision on something and I did it. And um, it was probably, you know, it was a thing that took me back a little time to catch up kind of deal, but it was okay. So I went back to the agency business in, in, in this company called the agency group to be the CEO of North CEO of North America and I bought part of it, and I did that for about seven years, and they represented a thousand artists, and I, you know, you know, ran a bunch of hundred agents and stuff. Really, wasn't what I wanted to do. I really, right. but I, I had to. Sometimes in life, you know, you have to make a decision on something, and I had to do something. Yeah. So I did that, and then you know, I kept, I did a good job, built the agency up, it turned it from being almost bankrupt to being worth something, um, and then uh, really wanted to work in promoting, and I went to Michael at one point. I said, look, I really just got to get out of here. And he got me out of here. So I guess it was in 2009, he said, um, and I tried to buy the company. So I only own 25% of the agency, mm-hmm. not even 10%. And I wanted to buy it out. So I had funding to buy it out and they turned me down. So that if, was, if I can't own it, I don't want to be here. Right. I may as well be in a bigger company and be an executive and get paid whatever for that right. kind of thing. Right. So that's really, so I ended up in 2009 joining, joining Live Nation to, to run this artist group. And then wasn't really in the promoting part at the beginning, but then started promoting, and it's the greatest company I could be in. I've been able to do things like, you know, I promoted Prince doing all that stuff. And Michael, no one, no, the other thing was because Michael, he was involved with me from the beginning. So he knew, like he knew Prince too, like I did. And, you know, Prince always wanted to talk to the big guy. So Michael became the big guy, so, you know, to talk to him. And then, but I, it was all, that was a special thing for me. But then you know, this company has allowed me. I put Guns and Roses, you know, back together. You yeah. know, with 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 a team. I wasn't just me. It was my right, it was course. manager, his manager Fernando, and his agent Ken and I sort of came up with a concept at one point. And you know, Fernando, it's not easy to do this stuff. Did that? I put the I did the tour with the Beach Boys with Brian in it. The reunion. I, I mean, I did. Got to work with the Dixie Chicks to, when they came back. Um, I feel like you know. a lot of the things that we've heard from you today has been all about personal relationships and you, yeah. you know, you live that management side, you live the agency yeah. side. So I kind of feel like artists will trust you even more because well, they, I, I they know. Well, I'm really, no, I do. I mean, I think they believe me because I, first of all, you have to be believable, you know, sort of thing. So they, they see that I actually did something. I mean, you know, like artists like, it's a very weird thing to talk to an artist like to, to get them to buy into you as a business person is a very hard thing to do you know i'm doing i got the swedish house mafia i'm about to do their tour backstreet boys you know i've worked with them from the beginning but i helped really reignite them again when you say artists are you actually talking to them or are you talking to their, their, general, their team no I, I i'm what i'm talking about is their team and them i i yeah. can't i can't i can't waste my time on not talking to see I don't real. Having been an agent, I know how that works. That's what I'm okay? saying. Yeah, I've been a manager, so I understand how that works. Right. So I I don't want to be direct with them. If I have to, I will because I'm, there's no barrier to me. It's like it's like because because people try to control those relationships, and yeah. I think they're making a mistake. Like if you want to if you want to manage someone, you should be willing to trust that they trust you and not be afraid. Right. Right. So you got it. So I tr- like I, the managers I work with. I mean, they slowly get to know that. I'm not trying to do anything like they're going to be, I want them involved, even though, you know, you're fighting I, for yeah, them. I, yeah. I become part of your team. Succeed. You can go somewhere else and yeah. you can work with someone else. I don't really like, that's a thing, but yeah. you're not getting me. And, and you know what? You don't, and there's other good people, but you know, there's not that many people that 
really understand you, meaning the manager too. So yeah, right. you have to understand everyone. Everyone has a place. Plus and it sounds like when you give your word, you keep it. it. I keep my word no matter what happens. I will. You know, I have to. I like that. No, I have to. And, I, and I've lost my house before. It's kind of thing, you know, kind yeah, of right. thing. So it's like I, I could have not. I, then, then, but the thing, it's like then I wouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Just take it. That's how you Hopefully get, don't that's that how you ever. Here. I hope it doesn't happen again. I'll like, be working for Labatt again. <laughs> I'll be back. Here, you want to buy some beer? <laughs> <laughs> we, would, we would buy beer for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. You sold us today. Okay. Um, well, uh, we, we've started a thing where one of the la- final questions we ask every guest who comes on the show, and this is going to be probably harder for you. I think so. If you hadn't have made it as a promoter or doing what you do, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, I think if I had made it as a promoter, I think I'd own a summer camp. Summer camp? Okay. <laughs> I never would have guessed that. No. Yeah. I mean, that was sort of the, 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 when I was thinking about what I'm going to do next. That's what I'm thinking about a summer camp. You can still do a summer camp. Well, it'll be a summer camp for kids for music around the world to come and, pl- and have a studio like this where they could have Pharrell's, you know. Yeah. Like work with them and they, they're from all over the world so they would actually speak they can't be from the guy believe the world needs to be more uh in touch it is in touch with the kids it's just not in touch with the politicians and everyone else right, 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 right. like the world's the world and it's always been like this i mean the things that inspire me like you know when we live aid is a remarkable thing that changed things i mean right now i can't believe nothing's happening i mean like people, like the artists themselves are the only ones who can implement change. We're all just fighting for ourselves right now. We don't care about all the people dying in Brazil. We don't care. And so even though I'm a capitalist and I want everything, I want everything I can buy, I would like to do that and have everyone else have an opportunity to do the same, you know? Mm-hmm. Right That's on. sort of it. And they don't have the opportunity. They're just born somewhere else and they're just stuck and they don't know how to get out. I agree. Yeah. That's so amazing. Summer Steve. camp. Yeah. Well, we'll, well, be, we'll be counselors. Can like, I, we have, we have no music counselor. ability, well, but we'll be counselors. No, Wait, I could sing a little no, bit. No, that would be the idea relax, that you relax. would have at the summer camp. Everyone could just, I mean, listen, I can't, you can only do one thing. If you just start with a little egg, and if, if you had, so if, let's say you have eight weeks, and in eight weeks, you could have 80 kids. And if 80 kids were from 80 countries, okay? And they come, and they, they're they all into music. And then you have le- the people in music working with them, and not just like someone helping them with how do you do an interview, how do you do this. And the best people, they would, they would tell you, like yeah. someone who's, who's done that, Here's, how do you write a song, how do you get the production, who's your production man, like all that stuff. While you're doing that, they're talking about their countries to each other. Yeah. And just breaking, and realizing they're just all just people. That's mm. a, I feel that's that a with your Rolodex, this... Could no, happen. I can Could I, happen. No, I think, but I see, I don't think, yeah, so you said what would I have done? So, I don't, yeah. I think I would have not done that. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to change your mind. No, I wouldn't have done that. I mean, because I, I wouldn't have been able to do it, maybe. Or you maybe, you, it. maybe you needed to do all of these other successful yeah, maybe things it's all so part that of you the, have the position well, to do so that. So you can then justify why you did it. Right. Right. Maybe. That's it. We'll still be awesome. your camp counselors. Yeah. I just want Sign you to Sign us up. That. Are we good? Uh, we're good, we're almost good. Almost, almost, <laughs> almost. All right, so... Um, anyway, for everyone um, who's out there watching us right now on YouTube, listening to us on Spotify, uh, Google Play, iTunes, we appreciate you. Please uh, click uh, that subscribe button because that makes us happy. And like us because oh. I'm, I'm my ego. The like, the bell, all those good things. Um, and um, as a final farewell, thank you so much, Steve, for coming, sharing all these crazy appreciate good it. stories. No. Appreciate you okay. coming on, and um, I think that will do it for today. Unless you have anything else you want to add on there. No, thank you. Good. Thanks. Appreciate, Appreciate you, man. It, man. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week.